Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining Tricycle's online practice session today. I'm very happy to introduce our guest teacher today, Sylvia Borstein. Sylvia is a psychotherapist, author, and meditation teacher. She is a co-founding teacher of Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Woodacre, California, and a senior teacher at the Insight Meditation Center in Barrie, Massachusetts. So today we are on a Zoom webinar. So unfortunately, participant audio and video are off. Um, we are recording the session for anyone unable to attend live. And you can view recordings as well as the schedule for all of our upcoming sessions at tricycle.org slash live. And our next session is this Thursday at 3 p.m. with Locke Kelly. If you'd like to make a donation to support our free offerings like these, you can do so at tricycle.org slash donate. And we really appreciate the donations from other people who have come in already. Um, they really help us to support offerings like these. So finally, um, we'll have time for Q&A toward the end of the call today. Um, Sylvia will start with some talk about uh, where we are today in this situation in the world and then lead a guided practice. But at the end of the call, we'll have Q&A. So you can post your questions in the Q&A panel below the video screen. There's a button that opens that up. And if you're tuning in today from Facebook Live, welcome. You can also post a question in the comment section there and we'll add it to our list of questions. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can toward the end of the call and we'll be on for about an hour in all. So thank you to you, Sylvia, for being here with us today. And I'll turn it over to you now. Well, I'm happy to be here and good morning to everyone. And uh, as Dania and I were talking uh, just before uh, everybody arrived into the space, we were talking about the amazing, uh, uh, the amazing ability of modern technology to connect the whole world together as we are now. It's, uh, uh, it's always been for me important along with studying the philosophy and the understanding and the wisdom of the Buddha, which is based very much on recognizing the struggle, the suffering in all human life and presenting a way of life that addresses that suffering to balance the mind by also recognizing the amazingness of life itself. It's true that the first noble truth that in any life there is challenge and uh, the, the need to continually be dealing with challenges and the challenge of loss and the challenge of everything else in life all through our lives, but that the fact of the amazingness of life itself, not that, not what is happening, but that it's happening and how it's happening and never before in the history of human beings on this planet could so many people come together and talk to each other and see each other and send each other notes and connect with each other. I've been having in mind the little pictures that you see in an airport, uh, in airplane uh, magazines, online onboard magazines, where they show you the routes of all the airplanes and there'll be a hub city and then arcs that go to places all over the globe and all the way around the other side of it. And I feel as if this morning, uh, Danya's in New York and I'm in uh, just, uh, just north of San Francisco. And there are little arcs from Tricycle's headquarters in New York, from Danya's living room, in fact, and from me in California. All these arcs of connection to people all over the world. And it's thrilling to me that human beings have figured that out. I keep thinking that uh, part of our evolution as human beings figure it out will be to figure out how to get along with each other so we can live on this more and more small planet in a way that's harmonious and will promote the healthy endurance of this planet. So I thought about what to teach about and what did I want to talk about in this time that we have together. And I thought uh, the thing that's been most clear to me in the last few year, weeks that I've been at home during this period is that I didn't really uh, imagine that this being on retreat as I feel that sequestering is, has provided for me many of the same insights that being on retreat in a retreat center, I depended on before. I actually thought 
I would call uh, this talk, if this is a Dharma talk that I'm about to say, that I would call it an epidemic of virus creates a new retreat, or I would call it an accidental retreat, or I would call it the purified, the alert mind purifies itself, or I would call it widening the window of tolerance. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I have to say, and then you'll see, maybe we could have a vote on which is the best title for this. So I'm not on retreat, but I am, because things are happening to me that happen on retreat. But I'm sequestered at home. I'm not alone. I'm sequestered at home with my husband. We don't have the same noise and bustle that people have if they're living in the middle of the city. I live in a suburb and uh, it's, it's full of people, but it's relatively quiet. Anyway, in the middle of all that quiet, which really mirrors what happens on a retreat, we have emails and uh, Zoom calls and Netflix and telephone calls and the New York Times arrives every morning on my, uh, in my driveway before 6.30. So I am not sequestered from the world and I know what's happening in the world, not at all sequestered as I would be uh, on a retreat. And surprisingly to me, I'm really feeling quite centered, quite present, quite alert. I take a walk every day around the block and other people, neighbors of mine, take similar walks. We're all wearing masks. And we wave at each other at the prescribed distance uh, to avoid being too close, but everybody is being very cool about it, very nice about it, very sensitive about not intruding on the space. Everybody on that walk is in a condition of high alert. We're all, I'm noticing that everything is a condition of high alert, remembering how, how and how I'm going to arrange to get my groceries, uh, just remembering because I get up every morning and I think, how's the world doing? How are we? I think the whole world is getting up every morning and thinking, how are we? So everything is more high alert than usual. I'm discovering that my mind is doing what it does on retreat center, which, offer, which is that it's offering me surprisingly freeing insights that I am confident are changing my mind in a wholesome way. I'm, I, if I think about changing my mind, which by the way, I used to be, I don't remember if it still is, the sort of catchword or watchword or motto of Practical Magazine used to be change your mind. This retreat is changing my mind. This sequestering at home is changing my mind in the best possible way. I used to think you had to go on retreats for it to be quiet and sheltered and secure that every, that that mind had to be, the mind had to be tranquil and alert. My mind is not tranquil. I don't think anybody's mind is tranquil these days, but it is super alert and it's alert all the time. Really, the newspapers and uh, the emails and the web calls are keeping it constantly alert. In the evening uh, at eight o'clock, I suppose it is for many people across the country, People are out banging on pots and pans outside, even in the suburban neighborhood. Remember, oh, okay, it's eight o'clock and we're all alert and we all know that we are still safe and well and sequestered here. This is how my mind is uh, behaving in the way that I hope it will change when I'm on retreat. It's super alert and it's perceiving things in a new way. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm walking along the street on my walk with my mask and I look over on the other side of the street and the person that I see coming around the corner and now walking down my street uh, is really, I don't know who it is because they have a mask, but their gait and the way they walk and the way they stand and their hair sticking out look like my cousin X. And I have that realization, oh, it looks like Cousin X. Usually when I think, oh, that reminds me of Cousin X or it is Cousin X, it comes up in my mind with a slightly un, 
pleasant feeling about it. Uh, cousin X is a little hard to get along with, actually. And uh, I don't look forward to the family times that I'm together with Cousin X. But anyway, so I see what looks like Cousin X. And I expect that my mind is going to carry on with reminding me of the reasons that I don't like Cousin X. And it doesn't do that. It's it, in the space that it would feel, ah, and, not, and remember why I don't like Cousin X. My mind says to me, you know, Cousin X had a very hard upbringing very difficult circumstances. That's probably why he behaves in that kind of awkward way. I thought to myself, look at that. My mind has substituted a new story for Cousin X, a better story. It's an opinion that's more expansive and more forgiving. I, I, when I thought about it afterwards, I thought that Dan Siegel uses the term, uh, the window of tolerance. I thought, oh, look at that. My window of tolerance has gotten much bigger. I'll tell you another example that makes that same point, I hope. I was sitting at this very computer uh, writing about a week ago, and I was glad to be writing because I had just had some very good idea. I was about to write it down. And my neighbor just across the road, out this window and just the other side of the path, uh, all of a sudden from that property came the vroom sound of somebody starting up a leaf blower. Normally, in that moment, I have a litany of practice responses that start from, why are they leaf blowing? It's such a waste of energy. It's such a polluter of the air. It is noise pollution. And all of my neighbors do it. Other towns in this county don't have ordinances, and they can't blow leaves. You have to rake them. And I should start a petition, and maybe I should send it around the neighborhood. Now, first, I'll put it in everybody's my uh, mailbox around here and I'll collect signatures, bring them to the Board of Supervisors. And the other day, the vroom sound started up and I didn't think that. I thought to myself, oh good, the gardener is, still has a job across the road. I'm so glad Sherry still employs him. And it's the same thing that my mind just, I have to assume, in an awakened, more expansive moment, allowed more data into it. I think it was Dan Siegel who said, window of tolerance, window of tolerance. My window of tolerance got bigger. It saw more things. And it made the sound of the, didn't make the sound of the leaf blowing lovely. It made the sound of the leaf blowing, just like the sound of a leaf blower blowing. And I went back and did whatever work I was gonna do. And I thought to myself, you know, this might be maybe who knows as good as a retreat. It certainly is a retreat. So I'm thinking to myself, my, my, my mindfulness path, my mindfulness practice these days, I explain to people is moment to moment seeing not only what's happening, but what is the response of my mind and my heart to what's happening and how I'm responding. And I, my fundamental line that I most like as an invocation for practice ongoing throughout the day is may I be free of negativity. It's the first line of a meta chant that begins, may I be free of negativity, enmity, and danger. I used to think that that meant may I be free of enmity meant may I be free of anybody coming after me like an enemy coming after me and the danger that it would manifest for me. And I think that's completely wrong. I realize what it does mean is may I be free of enmity in me towards whatever is coming out because enmity immediately fills my mind with stories about what I don't like about them and why they're frightening to me and why they shouldn't happen. And all of those stories constrict the mind, allow it to see less, figure out less, be less wise and more impulsive. It is I who am in, in danger of being confused if enmity arises and I let it be there. May I be free of enmity and danger. If I don't struggle, if I let it continue, if leaf blowing, leaf blowing continues, I haven't confused my mind with all kinds of thoughts about what should happen. And I realize the leaf blowing will be over in an hour. 
uh, if I fuss about it, I've just messed up my own mind. They, they have leaf blowers now, and they used to have rakes when I was a child. But when I was a child, it was a long time ago. And now is now. So that's what they do now. They leaf blow. And that mostly that my fussing about it with all kinds of thoughts is pain in my own mind. And I am creating the conditions of my own suffering, with my own negativity, my own aversion to it. In a larger way, not only the leaf blowing will be over in an hour, the epidemic will be over. There have been epidemics in history, epidemics happen. They are terrible for the people who get sick. They are devastating in many ways and our, our country will be changed a lot. I hope for the better. I hope for the world better. I'm really hopeful that as the planners of the world and the people in power in the world get to see that they can see the sky in Wuhan in China and that they can see the sky over Los Angeles and that they can see the dolphins in the lagoon in Venice, that uh, they'll think to themselves, maybe now is the time to decide no more using fossil fuels, no more going any place that isn't necessary to go or we'll go with other kinds of power and we'll figure out how to do it. I don't know what they'll figure, but maybe they'll figure this is a break in the unrolling of the world and a time to figure out ways to do it otherwise. Maybe that's it. I have a more expansive mind, maybe the world leaders will say, what can we do that we haven't done before that will mitigate the climate crisis, maybe turn it around? How will we do that? I'm really hoping that this period of worldwide awareness, really getting it about the radical precariousness of our lives and the preciousness of our lives. Who knew this was going to happen? Who knew people would suddenly be separated from their families and then in many cases put into a hospital from where they die and don't see their people again? What if I realize that all the time and everybody realize that, that this life is so precious, everybody's life is precious. Maybe people all over the globe will be, have a radical transformation of, of, of view. And maybe we'll all go from my story and my opinions and my needs to everyone's story and everyone's opinions and everyone's needs. It could be no, there are, in this case of the virus, there are no victims in this, no villains. This just happened. It happened because of something, something mutated with something mutated with some of the where and how exactly. We don't know and it doesn't matter. It happened like everything else. It happened because of something and it'll pass like everything does. And maybe we could learn in this particular hiatus of forward moving, that we could move forward in another way. I'd like to, I, I would like remembering that the last uh, line that the Buddha is said to have said uh, before he died was move into the future with confidence. I think I, I, I just like that a lot. There are a lot of translations of the last word in Pali, but move into the future with confidence. We have a little break on time where we can think about things. Suppose we, everybody stopped and said, wait, let's think about things. Let's heal. Let's get over what happened. Let's make plans. And then let's start again. That would be really amazing. I very much think that being able to make new plans in a world, in a mind that doesn't have fixed views of how it should be is what needs to happen. The last lines of the Metta Sutta is the pure hearted one being freed from, by not clinging to fixed views of how it should be done is not born again into suffering. 
we could just say all those views will have new views now. Let's all get along together and do it differently. So I'd like to offer um, a meditation that's based uh, on putting together the Buddha's teaching on the four foundations of mindfulness and the Buddha's teaching on uh, open-heartedness into one meditation. And it'll probably be about 15 minutes or so. So you're probably sitting. Could be lying down as well. But in the event that you're sitting, and I'm thinking it could work either way. Sitting is more alert though. So there you are, you're sitting. For a moment, close your eyes. Just because when you close your eyes and the breath goes in and out of your body, you feel it more clearly. Feel the breath without pulling the next breath in. Wait for each breath. Sorry about that noise of my closing the window. I'm glad I told that story about not being annoyed at my neighbor for the leaf blowing. So this morning, I just now had to practice a moment of not being annoyed at my neighbor for now doing some other building project that makes a tremendous amount of noise. Let's start again. Let the breath come in and out of your body, really letting it without pulling it in. I really value the awareness each time I sit of the fact that of noticing that I don't pull the breath and the breath is a gift to me. It arrives as long as my lungs work and my health is good and there's enough green matter in the world to keep the oxygen carbon dioxide balance working well enough to sustain life. As we continue to sit, you can keep your eyes closed if you feel comfortable that way. If you find yourself dozing off, you can open your eyes. I often remind people that being present does not require closing eyes so that you can know that when you're in your workplace, when you're any place else, in the midst of a meeting, or any, in any kind of seminar, checking in with your body, here I am, is a very good way of reminding oneself to be fully present. As you've taken a few breaths now, your breath has probably slowed down a little bit. Maybe enough so that when the breath goes out from your body, you can sense a little bit of a space before the next breath comes in. It's very brief. It's the opposite of panting. A breath happens and then another breath happens, but they're separate from each other. And it both calms the mind and body and keeps it alert at the same time, to actually make an effort to notice that little break after each 
breath. You might say to yourself, as breath comes in, breathing in, and then as it goes out, breathing out, and then as it waits, waiting. And then as you notice it start again, breathing in and breathing out and waiting. You don't need to change how you breathe volitionally. Your breath gets slower and you can do that. I'm going to count 10 breaths on my fingers. And I'll invite you to do that too. Or not, I'll tell you about it when we're, after I've done 10. But for when you practice alone, you might want to do 10 from the beginning to the end without losing contact with the breath at all. Totally focused on in and out and waiting. Let's start now. We'll continue to stay with the breath. <coughs> the next breath comes in and out. Particularly allow your rib cage to spread out with it. Breathe high into the chest. Breath in and out. And on the next breath, push your belly out. You breathe low into the belly, breathe in and out. Do that as slowly as you can, breathing to the chest and bringing to the, breathing to the belly. I'll do it six rounds, top, breath, chest, and the belly, just keeping the attention on how it feels in the chest and how it feels in the belly. So let's do that.
I always find it so amazing that without moving anything, just by a thought, different parts of the body move. Again, direct the breath, breathe here or breathe there. We'll just do a few more breaths this time, breathing with the awareness that the breath moves the whole body. It, it, it expands the chest and the belly and the rib cage, moves your arms and your shoulders come up a little bit and your bottom pushes down on the chair a little more. This is the whole body breathing like a balloon getting blown up or a football. Let's breathe five breaths in and out. The whole body breathing. And we'll sit a little bit more now with a slight change in instruction. Let the breathing be absolutely alone. Just let it alone. It breathes its normal breath and its normal cadence. And think about the fact that if we're well, for as long as we're well, from the moment we're born until the end of our lives, our breath comes in and out. Sometimes we manage it with, uh, with particular intention, but most of the time we just breathe in and out. And we can use the relaxed in and out of the breath to hold two intentions in, this, in the mind. As you sit fairly relaxed and alert, Well, as we breathe in and out, think to ourselves, may I meet this moment fully? Really means may I be awake, may I know what's happening. Not only that I'm breathing in and out, but how does my mind feel? How's my body feel? Am I content? What's going on? Am I at ease? Is my mind full of thoughts or empty of thoughts? Did I just suddenly understand something in a new way? May I meet this moment fully. That's my intention in mindfulness practice, to know what's going on. And the second thing I want to remember is may I meet it as a friend. May I meet it with warm intention. May I meet it with my heart inclined to stay present and caring, present and kind, present and tender, not to, not to do anything that's aversive or negative with the moment. Let it unfold just as it is. May I meet this moment fully. May I meet it as a friend. I sometimes use those two phrases on two sequential breaths. The first breath, in and out, may I meet this moment fully. And the second breath, may I meet it as a friend. Sometimes, and you can choose what you want to do, I do it on four breaths. May I meet this moment fully, I say to myself. And I feel that on the next whole breath. So that's two breaths. The next two breaths, may I meet it as a friend on breath three, and then feel yourself meeting this moment of sitting, of being here, 
of having a body, of having a mind that thinks thoughts and feels feelings. May I meet this fully. May I meet it as a friend. And we'll do that for two whole minutes. So let's do that. And I'll remember the time. Before we open our eyes, let's all of us think to everyone else who is in this meeting with us together, more than 1,100 people, 1,100 lines going from, going from Brooklyn, New York, and Marin County, California, all over the world. Think of everyone on this call and wish for them, may you meet, may you meet these moments fully. May you meet them as a friend. You can change the words. The words aren't magic or a stat. May you meet your life fully. May you meet your life as a friend. May all of you meet your life fully. May all of you meet your lives as a friend. And last of all, may I meet this moment and all moments fully. And may I meet all the moments of my life as if they're friends. And then I'll invite you to open your eyes if you haven't had them open. And I'll invite you to think about what we've done together and ask questions or comment or think or what you, whatever you'd like to ask about it. And I'll be happy to answer you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. That was such a wonderful practice. Really appreciate hearing your words today of gratitude and appreciation and connection and going forward from this moment into a, a new world and hopefully a different way. So um, we've got a bunch of questions here. First one I'll start with is, um, could you talk about the feeling of deep profound sadness for what's happening in our world, which sometimes overwhelms me and how to use that feeling in our practice? 
You know, that's a, that. Uh, I, I, what's the name of the person? I like to talk to people, Danya. Who asked? Yes, let me find that. Annabelle. Annabelle, thank you. Annabelle, thank you very much. Uh, I almost started, I feel like tears right behind my eyes that you asked that. I think if we all were able to sit with us, each other in the same room, and we could, we could ask how many people here feel from time to time a wave of profound sadness, we would all be nodding our heads and we would all be raising our hands because really there are so many people who are in pain, first of all, from being sick and from losing people who are dear to them and from losing the confidence that they can make it through the rest of this life, and from losing their jobs and from losing, this is a big catastrophic moment for the whole world. We've, lo we've lost really how the world used to be. Things will be different afterwards. And I do have um, an optimistic view about people having enough of a, of a wake up call to make a different world. Uh, I think about that because I, I think a lot about what did the Buddha mean by move into the future with confidence. You have to have, uh, if you get a choice, do you want to have an optimistic or a pessimistic view? I want to have an optimistic view because why not? Uh, even though I'm afraid that it might, it could be the other way. But I think that uh, for all of us, there are times in between where we'll get through this and we'll get over it and we'll build a better world that we suddenly feel the world is in a tremendous period of loss now. People losing people who are dear to them and everything else, uh, losing capacities, losing jobs, losing ways of life that they're not gonna have again. All of us, we're not gonna live in the same world. I've thought about it. I have, um, I have seven grandchildren all grown and uh, a great grandchild and one that's gonna be born in September. And I think what are their lives gonna be like? And it, it really is sad to me. Sad is okay. Sad is not an afflictive emotion in the sense of jealousy and envy and uh, greed and uh, anger being clouding the mind um, the clouding the mind uh, uh, emotions. Sad is just sad and it's worthy of feeling. When we feel it, I think it transforms our hearts to kindness. It's okay, it's just sad, that's it. And then we are more, um, I've, of, I've often thought in the past that when we realize that everybody is um, radically, um, um, susceptible to momentary loss. Our condition as human beings is fragile. And when I think about it, it makes me more kind, which is actually what I hope is the outcome of my practice. Let's, let's ask her another question, Danya. Thank you, Annabelle. So we have a question from uh, Rick Nayer who asks, I've heard several teachers talk about finding the momentary space between our exhale and the next inhale. Can you help to define that space and why it is important to look for it? Well, uh, thank you very much, Rick. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not actually a space because it's, you know, the body is shifting what it's doing. There's a period of time that you can feel your body has in some ways stretched to let in the breath. Um, and then the breath goes out. And then however it works physiologically, the breath starts up again. Uh, and it's really not so much that there's a space, but there's the experience of out breath happening. And then there's the experience of in breath happening. And before it, there's an out breath happening and it could be a very short, tiny period of space or before the next discernible movement in the diaphragm say is there. But it's not so much that there's a space as there's a discernible difference in the way the body feels. It, that you can say this is an exhalation is happening and now an inhalation is happening. So I could also say that uh, rather than say a space that there's a change of what's happening, out breath, 
in breath, out breath, in breath. And it would do the same function. It would call the uh, attention of the mind to a very precise moment. And the reason that that's involved in meditation instructions is that it's quite possible in meditation instructions that are soothing for the mind to fall asleep. Okay, in and out and in and out. And I'll just be lulled into sleepiness. Everyone who's gone to a meditation retreat or a meditation session knows that that's true. So that it's looking at meditations that sometimes say, now look for this and look for that are giving you something really precise to say on the lookout for as an antidote to, to somnolence. It keeps the mind alert and tranquil. You know, remember I said in the beginning, the mind is supposed to be a, a, a mix of uh, tranquil and alert. So usually you think about going on a retreat, you're more and more tranquil, tranquil, and then you fall asleep. So you have to have tranquil and alert. And my big discovery in these last few weeks is I'm alert as anything without being tranquil. So that, but it's really to do that. It's a meditation device. There isn't really a space. But thank you, Rick. Uh, we have another question from, I think, Raquel or Rachel, sorry. Um, finding it harder to meditate when there is a general sense of anxiety and could use some advice about how to stay present rather than seeking escapist activities. Wait, you need to tell me this. Tell that to me again. Sure. Um, mm -hmm finding it harder to meditate when there is a general sense of anxiety could use advice about how to stay present rather than seeking escapist activities. That's exactly what I, I, I Raquel, I'm Rachel. I'm very happy that you asked that because now is, I, there, there are things you can certainly do to relax the mind. But I'm, what I'm finding is that if, as long as the mind isn't distraught, that high alert, is maybe good for you in terms of seeing that things change and uh, people behave in a friendly way or that they, your mind changes. I am so happy about discovering my mind is purifying itself just by, without my doing anything. I don't decide to suddenly substitute a, a more expansive understanding of my cousin X. It just is. As I'm walking along, I don't think it's because I'm feeling tranquil. I think it's because I'm feeling super alert. There are other things true about X other than he's a little bit of a personality that I don't exactly resonate to, but there's more to him. He had a hard childhood. His parents weren't such good communicators. I, so I'm not so sure that high alert and not so tranquil is, is bad. That's my, my point. Also, that you need to have it. You certainly, it's much better than distraught. And I think that I, I would say not so much to soothe the mind, but to um, uh, exhilarate the mind. I think the activities that I feel wonderful about are, uh, oh, there are many of them. Uh, uh, listening to the, uh, the opera every day, which is every single day. If you go on metopera.org, if you go on National Theatre of London, every week there's a wonderful play. I love to see people who have tremendous virtuosity in things that I could never ever do that, uh, that lift up my mind and say, look at human beings, look what they do. Look what they figured out we can do this on Zoom. That's amazing. That kind of understanding of things are amazing. To be alive is amazing. To be alive is difficult and challenging always from the beginning to the end, which is the main thing that the Buddha taught. And he also taught that life is precious and wonderful and astounding and to see both of them. And I think we have a marvelous opportunity to see both of them right now. Thank you for asking about that. I don't wonder about not being tranquil because I don't think anybody is these days. So we do have a couple of questions on the, the, the topic of meeting this life as a friend, and I'm going to sort of group them together here. Um, so one of them is um, sort of just a comment that having struggled with suicide as a teenager, I find it very overwhelming to be able to greet my life as a friend. 
And we also have other people commenting that it, um, with struggles with perfectionism and having high expectations for themselves, it's more challenging to offer um, compassion to, or it's more challenging to become a friend to yourself than to offer compassion to others. You know, one of the things that I talk about a lot when I'm teaching metta particularly is that very question about, I don't feel like I can wish well to myself. Uh, other people are okay, but not myself. And the Buddha is said to have said uh, that uh, if you look the whole world over, you will not find anybody more worthy of your well wishes than yourself. And I used to think about that when I first heard it. I said, well, well, I don't get that really. I'm certainly not the most worthwhile person in the whole world. And I think what it actually means is that I'm the only person in the whole world that's actually, that is actually affected by who I wish well to. If I wish well to everybody else, it's a lovely thought, but I don't know if it flies through the air and gets into those people like email. Whereas if I'm able wholeheartedly to wish well for myself and to really be able to, which doesn't mean I'm the best or the wonderful person in the world, it means I'm the only person I can be. Then at least maybe I heal a little bit some of my sense of not worthiness, that uh, to be able to love myself as a pathway to really being able to love other people in the world and to be able to even see what I, what I see as my shortcomings or my things that embarrass me a little bit. That's just what came with the package. And to be able to say, that's, that's just how it is. And how can I really uh, relate to it with compassion relate to yourself with compassion uh, for having a hard time. You know, sometimes I say to people, I say to myself when I'm having a hard time, sweetheart, oh, you can't see that I'm putting my hands on my heart. I'll, I'll put myself back a little bit. I say, sweetheart, you're in pain. Take good care of yourself. What's going on isn't going to go on. What you're thinking isn't going to be true forever. What's happening in the world isn't going to be true forever. This moment is going to pass. Everything passes. May I be peaceful and happy. All beings, may they be peaceful and happy. The Buddha taught, the essence of what the Buddha taught is that peace of mind is a possibility in this life. I really love that. I like to say it. As a matter of fact, one of my teachers, Upandita, used to say, peace of mind, peace of heart, is a possibility in this very life. And I think to myself, I love that, that he said very life. That makes it more poetic or more something. But I love it in this, in this very body, in this very mind, in this very life, peace of mind is a possibility. It's a nice thing to say actually for a meditation mantra, in this very body, in this very mind, in this very life. May all beings be happy. You know, there's one more thing to say. For people who have had uh, really difficult times with depression, difficult times with depression, and find that that has gotten worse with this current crisis, this is a time also to consider finding someone to work with about that other than depending on your own mind, finding a social worker or a trusted friend, or um, a therapist, find somebody to talk to about your depression. Don't figure out that you need to handle it all yourself. Now is not a good time to take really difficult thoughts, like really difficult thoughts uh, that come up in depression. So I seriously wanna underline that. I don't talk a lot about it, but I wanna underline it for anybody who is discovering that any of their mental tendencies with, that was not so uncomfortable before, that's gotten more uncomfortable during this crisis, now is a good time to solicit some help for it, really, 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 in addition to the meditation. Or call, and I was just thinking, in addition to the meditation, you could also call a friend or two or three and make meditation groups and sit with them on, on, on Zoom every morning. Uh, I have all kinds of groups that I'm part of during the week. I have more company during the week 
during this that I had before it. They're all on my screen here, so it's different and I can't touch them, but it's very good for me. So it's really important. And also to say, every day is different. Every day is different. It's become almost standard for people at a meditation retreat, at a mindfulness retreat, to have one of the teachers read um, a guest house, the guest house by the poet Rumi, that every day I open my door and somebody new comes in, a depression, an old loss, a this or that. Your whole life is waiting outside the door of your mind all the time. And when there's a, 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 a special time in life, that door keeps opening and all the stuff comes up. And instead of seeing it as, oh dear, here comes my old affliction or new affliction. Uh, the may I meet it as a friend is a hope that we'll figure out something appropriate and friendly and compassionate and contemporary and um, eff efficacious to do for it, which also includes getting some friendship or some therapy or something. So Danya, are you there? Hello. I wonder what happened. Well, I see. Oh, Tanya is trying to reach us. Okay, I'll stay with you. <laughs> I'm very happy to be. I get to read everybody's name, everybody who's writing notes, and I see names of people, names of people that I haven't known in a long time, and uh, I've seen in a long time, and I think I wonder if this is the same person. There you are, Danya. Apologies, my internet blipped out for a minute, but I am back. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fine. Do you know what happens? I'll, I'll tell, I know we have to finish. But I'll tell you one of the wonderful lessons that I learned, uh, uh, I have learned more than once in teaching meditation. Um, every once in a while, not so much, somebody's cell phone rings in the middle of a meditation. And I check it out with people afterwards. I say, was this your experience or uh, not? You hear the cell phone ring and you think to yourself, uh oh, I hope that's not my phone. That's the first thing you think. And then the next thing you think is, phew, it's not my phone, it's not my tune. And you hear somebody rushing, uh, rumbling around, you hear them finding their cell phone and turning it off. And then you think, oh, I hope they're not too embarrassed, whoever it was, because it's actually nothing. Why does it matter? It's cell phone woke up everybody. It's like a little mindfulness bell. And so it goes from uh-oh to compassion for somebody else who it might be in that time. And uh, just in a short time, and every time it happens, I say to the group, so when that happened, didn't you think X and then Y and then this? And everybody says, yes, yes, yes. And I feel very good about that because I feel that it vindicates my belief that everybody fundamentally is wired for compassion. You think, oh, if that were I, I'd feel bad. So Danya, don't feel bad, you were great. <laughs> And I'm glad it was you, not me, actually. <laughs> Truth to tell. <laughs> I think we have to end. Do we have to end? Yeah, we are at the top of the hour, so probably close now. But I just want to thank you so much, Sylvia, for sharing this opportunity with us today. And thank you to everyone in our world, Sangha, for joining us on this call. Um, we do have another practice like this coming up this Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time with Locke Kelly. And you can keep checking tricycle.org slash live for the upcoming session dates, as well as to view the recordings of previous sessions. And if you'd like to make a donation to support free offerings like this one. So I wish everyone health and safety and happiness. And thank you all. And thank you, Sylvia. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>